Hi, and welcome to South by Southwest and today's urgently needed discussion with Senator Jeff Merkley from Oregon on democracy reform and voting rights and the For the People Act, which is a comprehensive Senate package aimed at bolstering basic ideas of one person, one vote and constitutional democracy. My name is Dahlia Lithwick. I cover the courts and the Supreme Court and the law for Slate. Uh, and I host the podcast Amicus. And I'm so delighted to be in conversation today with Senator Merkley on this issue. So I think I'm just gonna start by saying that we're here to try to connect two kind of attenuated ideas that despite Joe Biden's victory and inauguration, democracy has by no means triumphed uh, over impulses of authoritarianism and that we need structural reform to bolster uh, the kind of slightly rickety infrastructure we have now. And so I think I wanna start by just saying there's nobody I'd rather talk to uh, about this issue than uh, Senator Merkley, who's been working so phenomenally hard uh, to try to draw attention to and, and kind of shine a light on these issues. Uh, Senator Merkley has served as the junior US Senator from Oregon since 2009. Before that, he was the 64th Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives. He's been a leading voice in this effort to restore the foundations of democratic governance by taking on these issues we are gonna discuss today, vote suppression, dark money, gerrymandering, corruption. So Senator Merkley, I wanna, Welcome you uh, to South by Southwest. It's really a treat to get to talk to you again. Dahlia, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. And this is such an important topic for the future of our country. So I think I want to start by just saying that these ideas are not necessarily connected. I think there has been, we have lived through four years of illiberalism, of what seems like authoritarianism. And then you and I are gonna have a conversation about democracy reform and voting rights. So of course they're connected in some sense, but I think that for people who say, hey, you know, phew, we just emerged from a four year period that saw fundamental erosions of constitutional rights and freedom. And look, the system held, everything worked and we stood in lines and we voted. And so we can move on and think about other things. And I think you and I start from the opposite presumption <laughs> that the system held but barely. Uh, I think you told The Atlantic you see it as if, quote, the American vision of representative government has slid over the cliff and it's like we caught a root and we are just clinging onto it by our fingertips. So somewhere between the Capitol insurrection on January 6th, Brennan Center reporting showing that in the two months of 2021 so far, we've seen 253 bills to restrict voting access in 43 states, seven CPAC panels on vote fraud and stolen elections. You and I, I think, agree that this is not over by any means. This is ongoing and possibly escalating. But I'm going to ask the hard question first, Senator, which is connect what we've seen in the last four years for people who don't understand why democracy reform urgently needs to happen now. I'll tell you, this is the way I would, would frame it, that in any republic, you have a tension between the very powerful using all the instruments that they have to enact laws that favor the very powerful. And against that force, you then have grassroots uh, voices, efforts, organizing who wanna use the power of the ballot box to address the fundamental needs of ordinary people. So you have the powerful against ordinary families. And I think this is uh, symbolized by what we saw during the Trump administration, where they took their top priority uh, to be two things. Well, well two top priorities. Uh, one was tax cuts for the richest Americans. And the second was putting Federalists, members of the Federalist Society uh, into the courts. And the Federalist Society was formed to essentially have the courts find uh, a version of the First Amendment that favored corporate power over ordinary people. So these two things that, that were the top uh, driving force behind the Trump administration weren't about ordinary families, they were about the, the powerful. And, and why does this tension e exist? Well, you think about it, when you have a concentration of wealth, that money can be used to hire lobbyists, that money can be invested 
in elections. Uh, that money can be used in media campaigns to change the, the essential understanding of an issue on how to, how to frame an, an issue. It can be used in teams of lawyers that contest things in the courts. And it can be used after you have control of a legislature to change the laws so that the laws continue to favor the more powerful. And the, there is a, a point that really represents that completely. It's uh, changing the laws that make it harder for ordinary people to vote. So the voice of the powerful is threatened by the voice of the people. And if you make it harder for the people to get to the ballot, it, it makes it easier for the wealthy and powerful to keep doing the wealthy and powerful thing, which is make themselves uh, better off. So that is, that is this fundamental tension. And we see this right now uh, being played out across America where state legislatures and, and governors, particularly in states that have uh, Republican members of or House and Senate, state House, state Senate uh, governor, uh, proceeding to say, let's make it much harder for people to vote. Let's limit early voting. Uh, let's limit vote by mail. Let's purge the, the voting rolls of those who vote only uh, periodically. Let's force people to vote on, on election day, which means we can manipulate the precincts to make it harder to vote, understaff the precincts, reduce the number, reduce the number of drop boxes, put machinery in there that doesn't work. I mean, tell people that the vote was last week, so they missed the vote this week. There's so much manipulation that can go on. So this is where S1 comes in, the For the People Act. Uh, it says, hey, no, our job under the Constitution here in the Senate, we've taken our oaths of office to defend the constitutional vision of the participation of Americans in the direction of their government. That is government of, by, and for the people. Whether your views are on the right or on the left, you get to participate. And that's the battle we're in the middle of right now. I love what you're saying, Senator, because I think you make this really important point, which is it's easy to look at the last four years as kind of episodic anti-democratic moments. But what you're talking about is an entire infrastructure that exists. It long exists, pre-exists Trump. It will continue to exist after Donald Trump. And your point is that the capture of the courts, the dark money influence on the conversation, state Republican efforts to disenfranchise minority voters, that's been going on for a very long time. Removing Donald Trump and putting Biden into office doesn't change any of that infrastructure. The money is continuing to pour into that. And that's one of the things you want to turn off. Yes, ab absolutely. There's three basic uh, forms of, of corrupted practices that we're addressing. Uh, one is the dark money. That is money in our campaign system. You don't know where it comes from. You can't attribute who's buying those ads, so on and so forth. And it's hidden through uh, multiple shell operations uh, that move the money to and fro or people who never have to disclose in the first place. Back when we had the battle over putting limits on what you and I can donate to a campaign, that was the McCain-Feingold bill. So you had a, a progressive Feingold, you had a conservative McCain who said, hey, this money is contaminating the system. So let's put a limit on what an ordinary person can donate. Well, they put those limits in place, uh, but what happened is the, the money found another way. It moved through a whole series of, of uh, uh, PACs uh, that became dark money. And then we had a bill called the Disclose Act saying, hey, you gotta shine a light on that. And uh, we, we, it was so interesting because we had all these people who during McCain-Feingold said, don't put a limit. The answer is instead sunshine. Uh, public disclosure. And when we voted on disclosure, suddenly they voted against it, uh, protecting that money, the hundreds of millions of dollars that really stemmed uh, from 2014 forward uh, with Citizens United decision. So voter suppression, another big piece of this, and that's what we see in all these tactics I was just describing that are erupting in state houses across the country to make it harder, harder to vote. And then gerrymandering, which doesn't affect the Senate, but has a huge impact on state legislatures and on representation in Congress. And you hear these explicit discussions, let's further gerrymander our state uh, to uh, basically reclaim control of the US House of Representatives. Right now that bias, there are, there are Democratic states that are gerrymandered like Maryland, there are Republican states like Texas, but most political scientists say it amounts to about 15 to 20 votes currently in favor of Republicans, more bias in, and gerrymandering in red states. Uh, so having independent commissions set up the boundaries is, is a way to address this on, on the front end. 
I wonder, I, this is going to seem like an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I, is it fair to say that the GOP as currently constituted is enabling the narrative that vote fraud is rampant, that elections are stolen? Uh, this isn't, again, this predates Trump. This went on for a long time before Donald Trump, these practices of vote caging and purging the voter rolls, uh, trying to do away with early voting and Sunday voting. And, and I guess hearing things like 147 Republicans supporting Trump's attempt to overturn the election, Republicans still polluting the water with claims that this election was not stolen or people are saying, and so I'm saying that there was rampant fraud. It's hard now to disentangle the move to suppress the vote from official GOP and certainly CPAC talking points that really, I think, seed this narrative that you need to do all these measures that you're describing because otherwise fraud, fraud is really rampant. Oh, this is so interesting, Dolly, and it's so confusing to people because here I am saying that the elections are corrupted by gerrymandering, voter suppression, and dark money, and the bill to correct the corruption is not supported by a single Republican in the House or Senate because these are sources of Republican power for the most powerful in the, in, in the country. Meanwhile, the Republicans are saying, well, our best uh, uh, defense on this is a good offense. We'll claim that the, the ballots are corrupted by people voting who have no right to vote, illegal votes, invented votes, uh, votes counted twice, of which you ask, where is the evidence? And study after study shows there's no evidence. But it is in a very effective media campaign to justify vote suppression, to justify putting up obstacles and making it harder to vote, all saying you're seeking integrity when you're really seeking to do is prevent your opposition from voting. Let's recognize this has a, a deep, deep history in the United States. When the Civil War ended and the 13th uh, Amendment uh, was adopted to end slavery, it suddenly created uh, black political power in the, in the South. And the response was, oh my goodness, we have to stop blacks from voting. And there was a clause in the 13th Amendment, the slavery clause, which I'm seeking to uh, get out of the, the 13th Amendment, which said that you can re-enslave people if you arrest them uh, and convict them. And so all these new laws were created, the crime of being black, the crime, and by that, uh, it was the crime of talking too loud, of being unemployed, of standing on a sidewalk, of not yielding a passageway to a, to a white woman, so on and so forth. And this not only put people in prison, uh, stopping that allowed them to be re-enslaved and rented out as slaves, it also prevented them from, from voting. And so then we, we had that go right through, uh, we had, uh, a reconstruction which pushed back against that and tried to protect the ability of black Americans to vote in the South. And then reconstruction was wiped out in, in 1876 uh, by a political deal over presidential uh, election. And the result was the crushing of the ability of black Americans to go to the ballot continued right on through the time I was born in this country where we had the Jim Crow laws and all kinds of suppression that, that didn't, didn't start to be countered until we passed the Voting Rights Act of, of 1965. So this, this is a long history of political power. Those who are at the, the peak of the pyramid in America, trying to keep the people from uh, getting their fair share of national resources and programs on healthcare, on housing, on education, on living wage jobs, the four fundamentals of families to thrive, being crushed by the powerful to have more money, more tax breaks uh, for those who have the most. I think it's so important what you're saying because it's hard to wrap your head and I'm sure people who are listening to us are trying to wrap their head around the fact that most Americans can hold two ideas in their heads, irreconcilable ideas in their heads at the same time. One is they really like the measures in your bill. They love all of the, and that's a bipartisan, I mean, we, we've seen, you know, the numbers are, are staggering, Senator. I, I'm looking at polling data from uh, data for progress, 67% of all voters support the For the People Act, a majority of Republicans, 60% of independents. This is not controversial. At the same time, voters really believe 
that there is rampant vote fraud, that people are voting three times and busloads of Canadians are being trucked across the border to vote illegally and that people are signing ballots as dead people. So what do we do? I guess what I'm asking you is in, in some sense, this is a communications problem. This is an information problem and a messaging problem almost as much as a constitutional problem. Uh, you've got it exactly right, Dahlia. Americans live in two different media bubbles. And I was struck when uh, Trump was speaking to the Secretary of State in Georgia, asking him to find more ballots uh, to, or more lost votes to, uh, to, to elect the president, President's President Trump. Uh, the Secretary of State said to some of the claims that Trump was making, uh, Mr. President, those aren't right. You're getting those off social media. And Trump responded, no, 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 I'm not getting them off social media. I'm getting them off Trump media. Well, what is Trump media? Trump meeting is a collection of uh, cable television and uh, talk radio and uh, social media networks and, and emails uh, and mailings that, that come from the far right that create just this bubble that is saying, here's the message. And people have hearing the same message from the radio, from the television, from their social media, from their neighbors, say, oh, that's the story. That's why this big lie that the election was stolen and that there are illegal voters continues is it's very hard to break that media bubble. I go into a town hall in every county every year, and most of my counties are red counties. And so I make sure I've been watching kind of entering into both media bubbles to understand what I'm about to be, be hearing from my constituents. And this is, this is a powerful, challenging problem that we do not have an answer to in America. The president with the bully pulpit has the best ability to, to permeate both bubbles, but even for a president of the United States, it's hard. It's hard to get that media, that Trump bubble, that Trump media to actually give fair voice to what a president is saying is, as he or she tries to say, here's the story, here's the real evidence. As for the rest of us, it's, it's almost impossible to permeate that bubble. And, and, and again, I wanna just re-up something you're saying, which is it's not just the Trump bubble anymore because when you have 147 Republicans, when you have Senator Hawley, Senator Cruz saying that they too have deep anxiety that the election was conducted unfairly, it doesn't matter that you take away Donald Trump's bully pulpit because that message really is amplified exponentially. I mean, this is no longer just about what happened in the 2020 electoral contest for president. This is about going forward where again and again, the big lie, as you say, and you've been tweeting about this, is being repurposed over and over again to bolster things that have nothing to do with Trump anymore, everything to do with constricting the vote. So this, again, it transcends the Trump bubble. No, no, absolutely right. And people say, well, how are we going to fix this? <laughs> and uh, I must say, that's where we really don't have an an answer on, on how to fix this. Uh, it's, uh, it's deeply, the, the battle lines are deeply drawn. The, uh, the media that people listen to is their personal right to choose what they want. Uh, and uh, Americans have chosen and rural voters uh, tend to choose one, tr one bubble, the Trump media bubble. And, and then you have uh, uh, different cable and, and uh, different sources of news that tend to dominate in urban areas, uh, reinforcing this deep division. And so even though, as you point out in the polling, the majority of Republicans uh, can support a bill, that doesn't mean that it's going to be bipartisan here in, in Congress. And a really good example right now is the Reconciliation Act. Uh, which has strong support from independents, from Republicans, from Democrats. Uh, most of us are getting calls from very conservative uh, county commissioners from, from Red America saying, we really need this bill. We need it for the vaccines. We need it for the state and local government piece. We need it to help get our kids back in the classroom. Please pass this. And yet, we are probably not going to have a single Republican in the Senate vote for this bill. There wasn't a single Republican in the House who voted for this bill. And it's, it's the... This is, the, that, this is the, the deep chasm that has emerged between the, the parties where each side thinks it's right and uh, thinks the other side is evil. And um, it is very, very hard to resolve that division. So I'm glad you brought up the Reconciliation Act because it, 
lands me squarely at the next inexorable question, which is I think the one you probably hate most, which is what do we do about the Senate? It, it, it's clear. And I, I think you and I, uh, you came on the podcast and we spoke in 2018 about just how profoundly distorting the Senate has become in terms of just basic principles of majority rule, one person, one vote. And there is this paradox, right? Where you are trying to bring forth legislation that is both wildly popular and preserving of just basic tenets of majority rule, it's being already declared dead on arrival in a Senate that doesn't function to represent the will of the majority. So I know you don't have a good answer to this, but spitball with me beyond filibuster reform, what can we talk about in terms of imagining a Senate that actually was responsive to both COVID relief, minimum wage, uh, uh, raising the minimum wave and wage, excuse me, and simply making voting simpler. Well, Dahlia, you really handcuffed me when you said beyond <laughs> filibuster reform, uh, because it is, the, it is the big challenge. And when we say filibuster, we're not talking about people standing and speaking at length. We're talking about 60 votes to close debate and Mitch McConnell wanting to prevent anything good being done for America while a Democrat is president. This was his organizing philosophy that brought him to uh, be the lead of the, the Senate Republicans that brought him into power after Citizens United unleashed the, the hundreds of millions of dollars of dark money. It's a principle he lives by and he lives it every single day. Obstruct, delay, obstruct, delay. What can I stop today? What can I slow down today? Because the last thing he wants is for us to make things work better in America while a Democrat's in charge. And this is, this is to me is profoundly unpatriotic. Uh, it, is, it is basically damaging American families in every way possible for the pursuit of power. I can't think of anything kind of worse than that for a public, so-called public uh, servant. So that's um, the challenge. And there's many, there's many paths to overcoming this when it comes to defending the constitution. And one path is that we have the bill on the floor, the S1 for the people on the floor, and we say, hey, it's it, you're going to be full opportunity to participate. Um, germane and relevant amendments, simple majority will legislate, but in exchange, you don't exercise the McConnell veto, the 60 vote barrier, and, and we will get to a final vote. I don't, I don't nobody really thinks that is possible, but, but it's one path. Another is to say, this is so fundamentally important, defending the constitution, that we should agree to carve this out uh, from the McConnell veto. In the seventies, we've carved out protect or attacking the deficit in special budget reconciliation. So a budget reconciliation process is a simple majority process designed to reduce the deficit. The Republicans then when they were in power corrupted that and said, let's use it to increase the deficit to give tax breaks to the wealthiest Americans. So they have been determined to do carve outs for their top priority, tax breaks, uh, money, raid the national treasury, give $2 trillion to the richest Americans. That's what they did in 2017. And so are we willing to carve it out? Uh, there's other ways to go about this. Uh, there's get rid of the filibuster completely. Uh, there is the, uh, hey, up until the mid seventies, you pretty much had to carry on on the floor. A filibuster was a very public event. After a 1970s rule change, it meant that we have the silent no-show filibuster, so no makes no effort to obstruct. Let's restore the requirement that you have to show up and you have to speak. Uh, and so you, you can't obstruct with, uh, without any effort, which has led to massive obstruction. So we have to consider all the opportunities, including a heart-to-heart -heart dialogue with our colleagues about making this place work again. And I hope we can find a way. And I want to stipulate, I didn't mean to handcuff you on filibuster reform. I just think we live in the world we live in, and it's fairly clear, uh, at least as of this taping, that Senator Manchin's not going to budge on this. And so I think I really appreciate that there are parliamentary and procedural and other uh, measures that you're describing to get uh, some of this past. I guess I do think there's some inherent value, maybe it goes back to your, your bubbles framing, but there is some inherent value in talking about this. And I imagine part of why, you know, you're out on the hustings fighting for this is to force Americans to reckon with something that seems, we only think about it two weeks before every presidential election. 
We just don't engage in questions about what happens with the census. What do we mean about uh, uh, redistricting? What are we talking about with gerrymandering? That all seems so wonky and abstract. And then two weeks before every presidential election, we all run around you know, with our hair on fire saying, yeah, the system is really archaic and broken. I, I guess I wanna ask you if, and, and I'm in no way implying here, Senator, that this is you know, doomed for failure because of the filibuster, but there is an inherent value in talking and talking and talking to Americans in the off season, as it were, about how close we came to losing democracy because a lot of these systems of minority rule are really, really irrevocably broken unless we repair them, right? Oh, it's, 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 so, it's so true. And here's an interesting exercise. Uh, take a look around the world at other republics that have reached our level of wealth and inequality and see if they have found a way to start restoring a legal process that produces benefits for ordinary people rather than more breaks for the, the best off. In other words, more wealth uh, inequality, more income inequality. I've had my team do this and uh, we've been looking through history as well. And here's the dismal fact. We are at a very high level of wealth inequality and it's hard to find a single example of a republic turning that around. Uh, and why is it? It's because of those things I was citing about the accumulated wealth being lawyers and lobbyists and media campaigns and, and elections and packing the courts, uh, all, of, all of that stuff together. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could become the model for turning it around. And the only pathway to doing so is to restore the voice of the people, protect the path to the ballot box. It is the single most powerful weapon against the concentration of power. It is the most feared situation from those who are powerful and wealthy. And that's why they're doing everything across America right now to try to obstruct participation by ordinary people. Can you talk for one more minute about the anti-corruption piece of this? Because I think, again, it feels a little bit attenuated, probably for the average listener. Uh, you've made the point, I think, so forcefully about what dark money does and how it corrodes the messages uh, we get. But I wonder if looking at the last four years, there's any really concrete examples you can give us of things that would be remediated by this legislation that would really help help do away with the sense that American voting is ultimately just a function of sort of self-dealing by the wealthiest, you know, 1%. What's in here that would support that? Well, I think the, in the, the two pieces that I'll point to is one, gerrymandering. And so that, that actually people choose their representative rather than their representatives choosing their electors, which, which, you can have states that let's say are evenly split in terms of D's and R's, but, but two thirds of the seats go to one party in the state legislature or in the House of Representatives. Uh, so that, that completely contaminates the idea of fair representation, equal representation. Uh, and in terms of the voter suppression side of this, uh, you hear it every day. Uh, people uh, know that on, a, on election day, precincts are easily manipulated. It's easy to put out messages saying the vote's taken place. It's easy to change the location. It's easy to make it a location that's not easily accessible to parking or has stairs to stop the dis disabled from getting there or who knows what. Uh, you can put very few voting places in, in high population areas and, and lots of voting places in low population areas to, to bias the outcome. All these things are simply, simply wrong in terms of uh, the, the power of the people to, to be heard at, at, at the ballot. You can throw people off the voting rolls um, because you say, well, if you haven't voted twice out of the last four elections, we're scrubbing the rolls, you have to re-enroll, but nobody knows they have to re-enroll. So they show up at the ballot place and they can't, they can't vote. Uh, there's also an ethics component to this, this bill. And it says uh, that uh, uh, folks who are running for president or serving as president uh, they have to, uh, to get rid of their conflicts of interest, the types of conflicts of interest that were so troubling over the, the last four years in terms of family corporations and benefits that flowed. 
Uh, it provides for disclosure of your, your tax returns so Americans can understand those, those conflicts and, and diminish them. It provides for the first time a code of ethics to be developed for the Supreme Court, which has done some very, members of the Supreme Court have done some very troubling things uh, that uh, suggest that they're not unbiased when they, they wrestle with uh, the constitutional provisions. So in all these ways, we're, we're giving... Uh, the, we're protecting the voice of, of Americans. And realize there's two fundamental principles in the, in the ballot box. One is the right of every American to participate in the direction of their country. That's, that's incredibly at the heart of the vision of a republic. And the second is uh, voter suppression has been the largest source of systemic racism in American history. So if you want to see fair opportunity for all, then you want to see fair access to the ballot box. And we've had a year in which systemic racism has been much talked about, but sometimes we tend to forget that obstacles to the ballot are one of the biggest sources of systemic racism. So we're, 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 we're protecting or fighting for just fundamental issues of what it means to we, be a we the people republic, not a we the powerful republic. And I want to repeat again what I said when I introduced you, which is Brennan Center reporting showing that just in two months, we've seen 253 bills to restrict voting access in 43 states. That's four times as many bills restricting the right to the ballot as were enacted in all of 2020. So this is, and, and the epicenter of that is Georgia, right, where we saw uh, uh, just absolutely pathbreaking, organizing, uh, showing up, standing in line. And so we know that this is causal uh, and it, sort of sitting around and watching it play out really doesn't redound to the benefit of the right to vote. I wanna ask you, I think my penultimate question, but uh, an important one, I, I don't particularly wanna engage in the point by point objections we're hearing now to the legislation, largely because as you say, much of it is astroturf, much of it is sort of dark, big money, uh, boilerplate. There is a complaint uh, about the, the legislation that you've put forward, suggesting that it's somehow unconstitutional to do this at the federal level. And there was a big op-ed piece in the uh, Wall Street Journal sort of implying that this is the province of the states and federalism concerns are raised and that it, there is no way in which it is an appropriate thing uh, for the Senate uh, to be doing this. Can you respond to that only because it sounds plausible. Absolutely. Uh, the Constitution uh, says that the states can set the time and manner of elections, and they have control uh, over their uh, own local elections. But when it comes to, to congressional elections, the Constitution is very clear uh, that, that Congress can pass laws, so in partnership with the president, can pass laws that, that set the parameters for federal elections. Uh, so uh, that has been held up by the courts. It's very clearly written in the Constitution. Uh, do, we, do we have power over how county elections are held? Uh, city elections? No. State legislative elections? No. But when it comes to congressional elections, the Constitution lays it straight out uh, that this is a, a role uh, for Congress and the president. Um, my very last question is the one that is probably dearest to my heart, and I, I think you and I have talked about it before, and, th and that is the courts. Uh, because again, I think it's easy to say, this is, uh, we're saved, you know, the courts effectively were the bulwark against tyranny in the 2020 election. The courts really acted to the benefit of the country. Republicans, uh, Democrats across the boards acquitted themselves so beautifully and in much the same way that it's tempting to say, look, democracy survived, phew. It's tempting to say the courts really showed up uh, for voting. I think you and I probably agree that the courts are not part of the solution necessarily, at least as currently constituted, uh, and that the Supreme Court has been, I mean, you've mentioned Citizens United, we've talked about Shelby County, the, the and gerrymandering where the court has said they're staying out of political gerrymandering. The Supreme Court has been the cause of, not the solution to, a lot of the problems you and I have talked about here today. And I guess I, I know 
part of, of what you're aiming to do is, is think about how we do ethics reform and other uh, things around the Article Three judiciary. But I guess I wanna ask you how you think about the problem of the court as it now exists is probably arrayed against the interests that you are trying to protect, basic one person, one vote. What do you think we can do given that the courts are the courts, we got to dance with the courts that brought us and the courts are not necessarily the 6-3 Roberts Court right now is not necessarily on your side on so many of these initiatives. No, and I can tell you during the time I've been in the Senate, we've seen the Supreme Court become just uh, completely a, a, a partisan political uh, battle. Uh, we saw that when for the first time, the very first time in US history, a uh, Senate refused to hold a debate and vote over a Supreme Court nominee. That was a Supreme Court nominee Merrick Garland uh, by o Obama. And uh, the Republicans in control of the Senate could have said, well, yes, we're going to have a debate and we'll hold a vote. We may or may not confirm uh, one out of four nominees in our history for the Supreme Court has not been uh, confirmed, has been turned down by the, by the Senate. But instead they said there'll be no debate at all. There'll be no vote at all. Because Merrick Garland was such a centrist uh, that, that yeah, I mean, you had conservative senators who said things like, uh, well, if only the nominee was Merrick Garland, then I could support a, an Obama nominee. And guess what? <laughs> it was Merrick Garland. Um, the, um, uh, so that stolen seat that was stolen from the Obama administration delivered to the next administration, unprecedented in our history. It was just a statement about the determination of the Republican Party to, to bias uh, the, the, the court. And um, so there we are with uh, people across the country. They see that the, the, the court has become this, this instrument. They kind of suspected it when the Supreme Court refused to allow a complete recount of Florida when Bush was running against uh, Al Gore and uh, when uh, Bush was ahead with a partial recount, the, the Supreme Court said, let's stop the count right now while Bush is ahead. Uh, I thought that was an outrageous decision at, at, the, at the time, but, but hoped it didn't reflect an ongoing deep bias. But what we have seen with when Trump turned over the selection of nominees to the Federalist Society, which was formed explicitly to give corporate power to the courts instead of the vision of we the people, it's a vision of we the, we the powerful, which means anti-labor, anti-environmental, anti-consumer, and so forth. There is a case before them right now uh, that involves this directly and involves uh, two provisions in Arizona in voting rights. And one is, is uh, saying, hey, they have a provision that says and individuals can't collect ballots and deliver them to the drop boxes. And the second provision says, say, if you cast your ballot at the wrong precinct, it's disqualified. The reason these two things uh, are up is they were recognized by Republicans as changes that sound neutral, but in fact, really affect areas that are more democratic. Uh, that you have um, older inner city folks without cars who need somebody to take their ballot and drop it off at the ballot box or drop it off at the mailbox. Uh, because mobility is just difficult. Uh, and you, you certainly have in cities where the precinct places are moved often, often deliberately to be confusing. So the church down the street you think is your precinct voting place, but it turns out that that line was actually moved and that's for the next precinct over. So these things were designed deliberately to bias the vote in favor of Republicans against Democrats. The fancy term for it is disparate impact. And so the court has to consider now under this uh, case that they've taken, whether or not these can be struck down because they were designed to produce um, basically obstacles biasing the outcome of elections. And I'm afraid the court's gonna come down on the wrong side and say, no, it's, it's, it's okay that there's, they were done uh, with, with enough uh, uh, intent to protect integrity. And yet, how is integrity served by either of these? We do not have a problem with integrity in terms of people dropping off ballots for others. We've had vote by mail in Oregon for 20 years and it has been, I mean, you're more likely to get struck by lightning than have somebody uh, basically collect votes and, and uh, steal them or destroy them. I mean, very extraordinarily rare incidences uh, where someone has forgotten to drop off a, a ballot. Uh, so it is, um, uh, the, 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 we'll get a sense of whether this court is going to stand up for our Constitution or is once again, 
as in these other cases you cited, trying to undo that vision of government by and for the people. They would not take on gerrymandering, which is a major source violating the premise of equal representation, even though the Pennsylvania Supreme Court found a way to take it on to, to protect the people of Pennsylvania from, from gerrymandering. They proceeded to destroy the, the 1965 uh, uh, Voting Rights Act. Uh, they gutted it, uh, which uh, enabled many of these voter suppression uh, laws to be enacted that we already see in place in the ongoing uh, effort in so many states. And then they proceeded to say uh, dark money uh, that nobody knows where it comes from, even money coming in from overseas is just fine. It's, it's rich and powerful money. We will give it a pass. And so um, they have really done a lot of damage uh, to uh, the vision of, of a republic by and for the people. Uh, and here's where I have to have my reflexive tick where I say, and we should talk about structural court reform someday. But I want to end by saying uh, Senator Jeff Merkley has served as the junior United States Senator from Oregon since 2009. And he's been a leading voice in this effort to restore the foundations of democratic governance by taking on these issues of vote suppression, dark money, gerrymandering. Senator Merkley, before I say goodbye, I want you to tell these people who are listening to you and maybe feeling a little dispirited, what is a thing they can do? What is one thing they can do tonight? Tonight, you need to call your, your members of the House and Senate, particularly your Senate members, and say, you have a responsibility to defend the Constitution. You took an oath to the Constitution. If, if we allow, if we don't pass S-1, and we allow all these voter suppression tactics to be implemented in states across this, this country, particularly swing states, we are going to see uh, our government being uh, by and for the powerful uh, for a generation to come. So this is the moment when we have this slim 50-50 majority. Uh, we're, and that's where we're hanging on. We're over the cliff and hanging on to that route that it was, we're just barely hanging on to the possibility. We haven't climbed back up into safe territory yet. The way to climb back up into much better territory is, is pass bills that protect access to the ballot, that end gerrymandering, that end dark money, uh, that restore faith in, in the fairness of our elections across this land and give back the voice to the people. Senator Merkley, thank you so very much for all of your work, uh, making sure that our children's children uh, have one person, one vote too. Thank you. Good night, thank everybody. You. Thank you thank for you being much. with us.